Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to EnviroCenter's workshop today called 10 Steps to a Low Carbon Workplace. Um, I'm going to get started right away here. Uh, some people will still be trickling in as we go, and I'll uh, give some logistical notes in a second. Uh, but before that, I just want to say uh, thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're happy to be with you today. My name is Evan. I'm the coordinator for the Ottawa Green Business Programs at EnviroCenter, uh, and we're looking forward to this afternoon. So for those of you who don't know us, EnviroCenter is a nonprofit environmental organization based here in Ottawa. Our core mission supports sustainable lifestyles, which means that we encourage people to take action on climate in their own lives, in their homes, their workplaces and businesses, the communities, and of course, right here in our city. For those of you who don't know us, EnviroCenter, um, it was started in 1999 and has been based here in Ottawa ever since. Um, the four main sort of areas of our work are green homes, green transportation, green business, and green lifestyle. Uh, by pointing folks toward practical ways to reduce their environmental impact in these areas, we help them make lasting positive change. EnviroCenter's green business programs support businesses and other workplace organizations in working together to achieve our collective sustainability goals. We do so by sharing knowledge, resources, and tools for tracking greenhouse gas emissions and setting a reduction target, as well as hosting events uh, for networking, uh, challenges, workshops, and direct one-on-one -on -one support for our members. The Ottawa Green Business Hub is also part of a national network of more than 275 member businesses across Ontario, uh, with new hubs and partner programs growing across the country, so we can tap into broad support without losing our local focus. Now, our local network is made up of a whole variety of uh, members. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of some of them. Um, and we have uh, actually two new online members as well, who we haven't put up on the slide yet, uh, so welcome to them. Um, there's always interesting connections between our members. Uh, for example, like IKEA and Shepherds of Good Hope might seem like very different businesses, um, but they uh, both face challenges with uh, waste and energy use and high volume food service, for example, which is something they were able to sort of talk to through during an IKEA sustainability tour a few years ago. So um, it's always great to be a part of this, this big network, have that local focus and have that support from your peers in, in uh, the city. Um, you can find out more about who our members are at ottawagreenbusiness.ca. Uh, I'm gonna play a quick little video here about our program before we dive into the meat and bones of today's presentation. So just bear with me here. Thanks very much. So uh, we'll dive into uh, today's presentation now and talk about sort of what our goals are. Um, I do want to give out a few quick logistical notes, though. Uh, I will note um, we are recording the session, uh, so uh, it may be shared after the event, so keep that in mind uh, if you're participating. Um, please keep yourself muted during the presentation portions just so we don't end up uh, with any sort of weird audio overlap issues. Um, and of course, uh, we're going to be monitoring for questions in the chat box, so uh, please don't hesitate to type them there. Uh, and we'll bring them forward for a Q&A period following the presentation. And if time permits, then uh, people can ask their questions out loud as well. Um, so uh, through today's presentation, we're aiming to reinforce uh, the awareness about why uh, reducing carbon footprints is important for all of us, uh, including businesses and workplaces. Um, we're aiming to provide you with some practical steps that you can take uh, so that no matter what your workplace uh, does for its work, uh, there are things that you can do to reduce your impact on climate. Uh, and the environment more broadly. And uh, of course, we're also here to provide you with follow-up information so that you can take the next steps, uh, whatever they mean for your organization uh, moving forward. 
So why should you care? Uh, it's kind of a big question. Obviously, uh, we should all care about the planet. That's something that uh, we've sort of accepted as a, a society, but why should individuals care? What does it actually mean? We want to sort of make sure we have a common understanding here. So um, I think most people have a sense of what green ga greenhouse gases are and how they work, uh, but a pretty high level summary uh, with an example here are um, that Greenhouse gases exist naturally in this atmosphere, but human activity over the last century or more has increased levels dramatically to a point that uh, they're impacting our climate and it's been declared sort of an emergency globally. Uh, if you imagine in the picture that uh, the earth is sort of the plants inside of the greenhouse and the air inside the greenhouse is sort of the air that we breathe and interact with. Uh, and then the, the glass itself is sort of the, the GHGs in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and as we emit more and more GHGs, this glass thickens and traps more and more heat in the greenhouse, uh, which will eventually be unsustainable for the, the ecosystems and the, and the species, including us that live there. Um, we many of us have heard about a threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid sort of the most catastrophic impacts. Uh, and this has been recognized by governments now under the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, beyond that represents a level of impact that um, is predicted to destabilize populations, uh, ecosystems and economies. Um, it includes mass migrations, extinctions, crop failures, wide scale flooding, other extreme weather events, all kinds of things, which we're already starting to see now. Um, but we know that as we sort of cross that threshold, um, we reach a tipping point where the impacts may not be reversible and, and they may come faster and faster. So it'll be too late by the time we see the impacts to be able to correct for them. Uh, some good examples uh, in Canada's context are uh, the polar ice caps, which are a highly reflective surface. Um, as the temperature and the climate continue to warm on average, especially in the Arctic near the poles, uh, that ice melts, uh, which means less sunlight is reflected back off the surface back into space, uh, which compounds the, the global warming issue. Uh, same thing with the permafrost in Canada as it thaws uh, methane uh, is released into the um, atmosphere, uh, which is currently trapped in the permafrost. But as it thaws, it releases, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, so it, again, just accelerates the cycle of, of climate change. Um, so what do we do about that? I mean, on a, on a global scale, we know we have the Paris Climate Agreement uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees uh, at best practice, two at, at the very, very worst case scenario. Um, and of course, governments around the world have uh, jumped in to, to set their own local targets to make sure that they align with that. So our federal target was actually upped um, just on Earth Day of this year uh, in April from about 36%, I believe it was now up to between 40 and 45%. Uh, and this is the uh, total GHG emissions reductions based on 2005 levels uh, by 2030, and then aiming for net zero by 2050, which is really the key to the, to the whole strategy of fighting climate change. So those are some of the, obviously the big players on an international level, but um, everybody has a part to play. So here in Ottawa, uh, there are also mun municipal targets um, that are set up to um, basically guide uh, locals, whether they work for the city or whether they work in the city and are part of the community, um, about what sort of milestones we should be hitting. So uh, you can see that they have separate targets here for their own operations and for the community, which are a little bit different. Uh, you can see the city is planning to be 100% um, carbon neutral net zero by 2040, whereas the community has until 2050. Uh, but there are some deeper cuts. So by 2030, uh, community emissions need to be down by about 68% to be able to be on track for our targets, which is a pretty significant reduction if you think uh, of that as 10 years from now uh, and cutting emissions more than in half, essentially. Uh, and of course, one of the other things is the sooner that action takes place, the better it is because for every year that we don't hit that 68% target or that net zero target, um, that's more emissions going into the atmosphere. It's cumulative. So, so the sooner the reductions get made, the less uh, is going to be emitted over time. Um, so all that to say, basically, uh, it's time to act now and, and Ottawa as a community and, and as an organization is ready to do that. Uh, the city of Ottawa is a member of our Ottawa Green Business Network as well. Um, so that's obviously also still on a bigger scale than a lot of uh, people here might be focused on, but uh, why does it matter for one small business? Well, there are 18,000 businesses in Ottawa. Um, so when you start talking about one of them, it might seem like a drop in the pond, but again, everything's cumulative here. So together, that's a huge impact. Um, SMEs, uh, in theory, make up over 90% of the Canadian economy. So even though it's a lot of small pieces, uh, putting them together uh, really, really will change the game in terms of impact on the climate. So of course, these are all things about um, why you should care and what the impact will be on climate. Um, but what are the benefits for an organization like a workplace or business? 
um, beyond that, beyond sort of the goodwill and, and taking care of everybody here? Well, there are more than you might expect. Um, we tend to call them co-benefits because they sort of align well with reducing your carbon footprint and your environmental impacts. Um, but they they also can impact your bottom line in positive ways and, and other aspects of your of your organization. So um, typically they go hand in hand, which is why we call them co-benefits with climate action. Um, here are some examples that we see commonly. I mean, they're very different for different organizations. We'll actually talk a little bit about how they change uh, as we go a bit here, but here's some common ones that we're seeing a lot of. Uh, one is uh, growing demand from employees to take action on climate change. Um, this is something that especially uh, younger employees going into workplaces are asking about more and more often in their job interviews, putting the employer on the spot to talk about what they've done for sustainability, what their long-term plan is to fit into a green economy, um, because that will affect obviously their career trajectory and, and how they see their future. Um, it means a, a better acquisition and retention of talent. Um, you're going you're gonna to get better employees who are proud of where they work and willing to put in more. Uh, and you're going to keep them longer because uh, they're going to want to stay uh, among a culture of sustainability, which again, we're going we're gonna to get into a bit here. Um, of course, it also means a more efficient use of resources. This is a really common one for people on the facility side to look at, which is that as you're using less electricity or less natural gas, uh, even paying for fewer flights for business travel, you save money. Uh, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer for most businesses. And of course, um, leveraging your action to enhance your brand, write RFPs, attract interest in your organization. Uh, this could mean anything from partnerships or uh, customers or clients. Um, suppliers or distributors. Uh, these are all different um, different ways that you can leverage the work that you've been doing with sustainability to make sure you're connecting with the right people and positioning yourself ahead of the curve uh, in terms of the green changes that we'll be seeing uh, in the business world over the next uh, several years. So let's dive right in here to the meat and bones, the 10 steps. Uh, we're going to kind of walk you through start to finish the things to focus on. Lots of examples for each, lots of sort of sub steps in between, which will apply differently to different organizations. So uh, uh, keep in mind your own organization's context and then try to see it through that lens and uh, feel free again to post some questions in the chat, um, even if they're just experiences or, or, or things you'd want to share. Uh, we're happy to engage. It's, it's great to have some participation from the audience. So um, we'll jump into step one here, which we call discovery. Um, it might not seem obvious right away, but as you think about it more, uh, it's a pretty big one. Um, it's hard to manage anything that you don't measure or completely understand. Um, most organizations are already tracking everything else, financials, staff time, uh, orders, deliveries, purchases. Um, in order to be effective as possible, it's important to have that information and, and to look for those efficiencies uh, as you can adjust processes and to know sort of where your costs and hangups are. Um, this is also the case with GHG impacts. Um, knowing sort of what your emissions profile looks like uh, will really help you focus in on the areas that matter and really help you communicate your sustainability story uh, to stakeholders. Um, so a big part of that is knowing where those emissions actually come from, um, what the sources of them are. So you can start by asking yourself sort of where you think they are. Uh, and here's some, again, some common examples for lots of different organizations. They will vary between workplaces, again, uh, office-based businesses versus uh, someone that runs a factory, obviously will have a very different uh, emissions profile. Um, but these are, these are in some degree, usually applicable to most businesses. So I won't read them all off, but in Ottawa in particular, heating is a big one through the cooler months. Uh, electricity has a much lower emissions factor than natural gas. So electricity is obviously very important because we use so much of it. Uh, but gigajoule per gigajoule, making reductions to natural gas for heating is, is, a, is a really big impact for a lot of organizations. Business travel is another big one. Uh, we're kind of caught between Toronto and Montreal and uh, the nature of um, our city means uh, sort of a lot of international travel, a lot of uh, NGOs and, and workplaces that span sort of wide areas. So um, flying around is another big uh, emission source. So just thinking about how your organization operates uh, and trying to pin down what emissions um, sources are really impactful for you and making sure you get as many of them as you can, uh, if not all of them. Um, some are more important than others, scope one and scope two. We have other workshops that talk lots about uh, impact tracking and carbon accounting, so I could go on this forever. Uh, but uh, this is sort of the basics of the stuff that you would want to start discovering before you really dive into to more sustainability work. Um, in terms of tracking GHGs, uh, again, it's, it's really good to have a system not only to get a stock of sort of where your sources of, of emissions or revenue kind of thing are, but um, uh, it's also good for tracking over time and seeing progress and, and the impacts of initiatives that you might implement. So um, again, with any kind of tracking, standardization is really important. I like to highlight this at this phase. 
Um, there is what's called the greenhouse gas protocol, which is the most recognized framework um, sort of globally for tracking emissions. Uh, and specifically for businesses, uh, part of that is called the corporate accounting and reporting standards. Uh, so this is a framework that gu has guidelines and best practices uh, to ensure consistency and accuracy in collective sort of comprehensive activity and uh, utility data, which is to say basically um, organizations that are reporting on their GHG emissions are doing it in the same way so that uh, sort of an apples to apples comparison can be made. Um, and again, prioritizing sort of different methods of data collection that are that are more effective. Uh, like, for example, uh, liters of fuel um, prioritized over distance when it comes to tracking um, vehicle emissions, for example. Distance is great, you can estimate from that, uh, but fuel is better. So this is a great framework and standardization that kind of lays out uh, what you should go for uh, if the information is available so that everybody's playing by the same rule book. Um, the good news is though, you don't really have to do all of that yourself. Uh, you can, the, the information is available publicly online, um, but there are automated programs and tools now that you can use uh, with different benefits, different challenges um, uh, to sort of help you navigate that uh, without doing it all yourself and sort of an Excel sheet, which does work, uh, but it, it can mean a little bit more uh, work on your end. So um, there are freely available tools online. Uh, sometimes they're called carbon calculators is a really common uh, phrase. Um, I will say they car calculate more than carbon. Uh, carbon is just sort of the most common of the greenhouse gases to talk about, but they can save you a lot of trouble converting data into GHGs like gigajoules of energy, meters cubed of natural gas. Uh, these all have emissions factors that you could look up, but uh, these calculators will sort of automate that for you. Um, they do rarely al allow you to um, sort of store and track your data over time, which is a really good feature to have. So. Um, I like to say that with the free tools, you do sort of get what you pay for. Some of them are great. Um, it's great for sort of getting a ballpark of what emissions areas are more impactful than others, just so you can sort of see that. But if you want to track over time, a free tool is probably not likely to live up to um, your needs. And you also really want to make sure, a lot of them are, but not all of them are based on that GHG protocol uh, standard that I was talking about. So you really want to make sure that you uh, are, are looking into the calculators that you're using and not just choosing any one. Um, there are also, like I mentioned, sort of different emissions factors. So electricity in Ontario is uh, much more efficient per gigajoule in terms of GHGs than it is in, say, the United States or Alberta, where they're still using um, more natural gas, more fossil fuels to generate electricity. Uh, we have uh, a lot of nuclear power and a lot of hydropower in Ontario. So our emissions factor for electricity is pretty low. So that is to say a carbon calculator um, that's kind of generalized, maybe across uh, global or American averages, might not be accurate uh, for an uh, Ontario workplace. Um, another really popular tool in particular that um, a, a lot of businesses use is called Energy Stars Portfolio Manager. This is a, a big one um, in Canada and the US because it's approved by um, the Department of Energy in the US and NRCAN in Canada. Um, and in fact, in Ontario, buildings over 100,000 square feet are already required to report uh, using Energy Star Portfolio Manager platform for the Energy and Water Reporting and Benchmarking Program. Um, in 2023, that threshold is going to be lowered to buildings over 50,000 square feet, so it gets cut in half, uh, which will apply to a lot more uh, buildings in Ottawa, obviously. Um, a lot of businesses start here because uh, building emissions are usually pretty significant as a source of emissions uh, for most operations. And uh, complying with, or, or even getting ahead of, even better, these regulatory changes is another really important co-benefit for a lot of, um, a lot of organizations. Uh, so the drawback to this tool, I mean, it is, again, uh, really popular. It's really well used. I highly recommend it. But the drawback is, of course, that it only focuses on building data. So it doesn't give you a way to capture things like uh, commuting, uh, business travel, even supply chain emissions. Uh, these are things that um, can be really impactful for an organization to track. And sometimes, especially with office-based businesses, have a really deep impact. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this is sort of more focused on the building and property management. So you lose out on some of those other features. There are lots of customized tools out there. Uh, we provide one uh, as part of the Ottawa Green Business Program to members of the hub level. Um, it's sort of customized for Ottawa with our local emissions factors. It's based in the GHG protocol. So everything follows the same standards as all the best tools out there. Um, and we can provide with sort of uh, data entry forms, um, a visual report that shows progress over time, heating and cooling energy compared with outdoor temperatures, like during different months of the year. Um, 
which emission sources have high impacts, how that changes over the time. So it's a really comprehensive way to capture everything and to do it over time. Uh, but of course, it's uh, not a service that too many people will be able to provide for free. So it is uh, based on sort of a membership in our program. Uh, and there are others out there too with similar programs, but, uh, but we're sort of the best uh, option for Ottawa locally, I would say. Um, now, of course, there are also sort of a higher tier to that, which are the consulting firms that do uh, energy audits for commercial spaces. Um, we have a member in our network called Delphi Group that helps um, sort of large multinational institutions often uh, sort of capture their carbon footprint. Um, these come at a higher cost, but do go into a lot of depth. So if you have an organization or workplace that has a really complicated facility, uh, maybe several facilities spread over different regions, uh, this can be a really, really good way to, to get a deeper look and to get recommendations on specific upgrades uh, that you could do. They'll really look in detail at the, the specs of heating systems, insulation, that kind of thing. Um, I would say the one drawback to this uh, is that it is also a snapshot. So um, most of these services aren't geared towards tracking um, over time, or, or at least that comes with a higher cost. Uh, so it's a great way to get started, get a foot in the door. It's a great way to collect a lot of data for building an initial inventory, but it doesn't replace a tool that will track things long term. So that's sort of all the hows and the different options you have. Uh, and we have already talked about the co-benefits of sustainability for your organization in general, but there are some sort of really good co-benefits just to tracking, just that discovery alone, taking that very first step. Um, which are that um, GHG emissions are the most important environmental impact to mitigate, and they're not always incredibly visible. So being able to track them, being able to quantify, put them in numbers, put them in graphs so you can see, see the progress and see the differences uh, can be really helpful. Um, it's part of evaluating the overall health of your organization, like I talked about before, same as financial, same as HR. Um, and of course, uh, an inventory of your missions that allows you to track and report over your time allows you to talk about work you're doing, but also show results. So if you say we've removed um, uh, plastic straws or we've replaced our heating system and electrified it and that saved us X amount of GHGs per year, that's a really powerful statement compared to leaving it, uh, to leaving it vague. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, getting ahead of regulatory changes it makes for a much smoother transition once you start to fall into a category of business that uh, is required to report. Um, if you've already done it for a few years, then it'll make adjusting to any new requirements a lot uh, smoother instead of sort of starting over from scratch. Um, we've also found that just starting to track your emissions typically leads to reductions. Um, it depends obviously on the organization, but just being aware of something, being conscious of it means people are subconsciously doing things to, to make reductions. So that's another big part of it. Um, so commitment, this is another big one. Once we've got a, a sense of the, the footprint of an organization, we want to make sure that um, we have the, the tools and the commitment necessary to, to actually make reductions and move forward. So management buy-in is a key aspect of this for obvious reasons. Um, moving from an idea to action means uh, someone at an executive level is gonna have to make a decision and, and put things into motion, uh, possibly earmark some, some financing. So uh, sometimes sustainability is bottom up and it, it starts at the grassroots level. It starts with uh, someone on staff um, demanding better or asking for a change. Uh, sometimes it's top down. Sometimes uh, a board or an executive will decide they want their organization to pivot in this direction. Um, so depending on your business, it may be easier or harder to get that management buy-in if it's coming from them or if you're kind of bringing it to them. Uh, but tying things to the co-benefits that we talked about earlier, increased cost efficiencies and increased um, employee retention. These are really good things to bring up and, and to focus on if your management isn't as sustainability minded. Um, and also uh, depending on who you sort of uh, talk to, if it's, it's gonna require some buy-in from HR to get commuting tracking going, um, then you want to highlight the HR benefits. If it's going to be, uh, if you're going to have to look at uh, financial records for utility bills, you want to make sure you're making the case to the managers who are going to have to take some action there about how it's going to help uh, help in their area of, of work. Um, for example, as sort of a, a public facing local retailer, you might prioritize customer demands. Uh, so you might focus on branding and how, uh, how sustainability work could impact your branding and focus on sort of projects that work for that initially. Uh, we'll talk about low hanging fruit in just a sec here too. Um, as a tech firm, you might have a totally different focus on sort of acquiring top talent, uh, retaining them so they aren't moving around uh, within the tech sector. Uh, so that might be a more effective co-op benefit to highlight for, for someone in that uh, area. Um, and of course, case studies from other organizations like yours, data collected during the discovery phase, these are all also really effective tools for, for getting management buy-in. Now, of course, once you've sort of got that, that uh, buy-in from management, you wanna formalize things. You wanna, you wanna set a goal or a target sort of within your strategic or business plan as an organization, because this ensures that even if you 
um, have sort of staff turnover, even at a management level, uh, even if um, we get hit by a global pandemic and a lot of priorities shift really quickly, uh, it ensures that um, as things move forward, you have sort of sustainability enshrined as a goal of your organization and it allows it to carry forward. Uh, and, and again, keeps it on paper so that people don't forget about it or ignore it. Um, you can make stronger commitments like managing, tracking, reducing the carbon footprint in concrete terms. Even a commitment just to make reductions is a big impactful statement uh, to put up on your website until you can get the data, until you can take the steps necessary to, to have something more concrete. Um, you can also formalize policies like transportation and procurement policies around uh, sort of um, how you uh, buy things or, or how you incentivize uh, different forms of commuting. We'll talk about those as different steps going on, but, but formalizing them into a plan can be a really good way of making sure that uh, they're consistent um, beyond sort of a one-off initiative. And of course, making it public is another big part of this. So once, you're, once you've got a commitment internally, uh, you wanna start letting everybody know because people love this stuff. Um, people wanna do better. They, they know that um, there are some sort of uh, compromises that they have to make, but the fewer they have to make, the better. So if you're able to uh, communicate to your stakeholders the great work you're doing, they'll feel better about engaging with you. So, um, I mean, we know like members in our network, for example, the Shaw Center uh, has a cistern where they use to collect um, rainwater so that they don't draw from processed city water, uh, which reduces GHGs and, and water draw. They have signage in all their bathrooms that talks about it because that's where you're sort of using the water and it makes sense. Uh, really sort of a good touch point. Ikea has a lot of green products, but they post articles, social media, blog posts, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and of course, signage in store about uh, the work they're doing, the solar panels they've installed. Um, and uh, we have a, a local hotel and a, an Airbnb, or sorry, a bed and breakfast, second extra to say Airbnb now, but uh, a bed and breakfast in Ottawa that uh, predates Airbnb, that's always had the goal of being the the lowest uh, carbon impact um, accommodations in the city. So just being able to set some kind of commitment, some kind of direction for you to go is, is a really impactful statement, regardless of sort of the components, uh, but obviously something stronger and with data uh, is the best way to go. Um, other places you can include stuff like this, the about section, the about us section of your website is a good one. Even if you have a sustainability page, that's even better. Uh, any annual reports that you put out, uh, marketing materials, um, any employee handbooks or onboarding materials you use are a great way to make sure that this is um, sort of instilled right from the get-go with new employees. And even job postings, when we're talking about acquiring talent, um, including in a job posting information about your organization and, and your, your sustainability commitment uh, is really powerful. Um, we're seeing this from huge companies sort of all over the world. Here's a bunch of examples I won't read out. Uh, cater to your audience. Uh, sometimes it's a video on social media, sometimes it's an article. Um, sometimes it's uh, just an ad on the side of a web page. So um, depending on sort of who, who you want to be communicating with, you can do it in all kinds of different ways. Um, we, uh, we have a pledge as part of Ottawa Green Business, which I won't read out here, but it's kind of a, a, a group pledge. So um, this is a great way for organizations to make a commitment that's strong without um, before they're before they have access to a full emissions inventory of their organization so before they've maybe completed the discovery phase if this is a step that your organization is keen to take this is a pledge that uh, people can either use or adapt uh, to suit their own organization um, but it is basically committing to the net zero goal of, of 2050 uh, in ottawa so um, that's just a sample that, that people can use um, now uh, we're moving on to step three here. So this is engagement. This is sort of, um, maybe you can think of it as uh, almost the counterpoint uh, to commitment uh, in that uh, it can happen at the same time and often is sort of more from the bottom up than the top down. In the commitment sort of step, you're looking at making sure that the decision makers are on board. In the engagement phase in this step, you're, you're more trying to make sure that uh, the culture of sustainability is widespread and maybe not um, just living with sort of one or two people at the organization because it'll make things a lot easier in, in the long term. Um, a great way to do this is to establish a sustainability committee or a, a green team, as lots of people call it. That's what we call it here at Enviro Center. Um, it's uh, depending on how formal or, or casual you want it to be, but it's a way to sort of gather a, a group of people who are passionate about sustainability in your organization to share some of the work, inspire each other, uh, and uh, and keep things sort of consistent again if, if there are staff turnover or people coming and going, taking vacation, taking leave. Um, it's important uh, to get input from various perspectives and departments. Uh, we have seen before 
where maybe just the comms team puts together a sustainability committee and uh, and then they don't get as much input as they maybe need from HR or facilities. Um, so, so it's good to make sure you have a sort of a broad range, uh, both within sort of different levels in terms of management and, and staff, but also within different departments of an organization. Uh, and of course, listening to employees, uh, their needs, their interests, um, what people are focused on in terms of uh, uh, sustainability with the organization can be a really good thing to keep in mind as you um, are looking for ways to get started and build momentum and, and, and engage with staff and, and build out this culture. So listening is really important. Um, and of course, engaging with partners. If, if you are uh, dealing with other organizations, if you're a business to business facing workplace, um, making sure that you know what your partners are interested in and what priorities they have in terms of sustainability can help guide uh, the sort of culture that you, you want to develop here. Um, so yeah, start by asking your staff uh, sort of who um, is passionate about sustainability, uh, who has strong feelings about specific um, uh, areas about sustainability in the workplace, and of course, uh, asking the same questions of partners. Um, now, the other thing that a sustainability committee can do is help with that reporting aspect. So we talk about public commitments for sure, that's really great, but being able to also be transparent about progress uh, is really good. So having a green team allows you to sort of spread out the work of collecting data uh, quarterly or monthly or annually, depending on how often you do it, um, to report on those activities, the, the reductions you've seen when you've uh, made changes, uh, also to keep track of things like incentives or challenges or barriers that you've run into along the way uh, that you can share or take advantage of or, or find solutions to uh, in partnership with the rest of your green team or even other green teams at other organizations. Um, so, so those are um, important ways to, uh, to make sure that this stays sort of public and, and, and engaging for everybody. Now, step four is what we call low hanging fruit. And this um, can mean very different things for different organizations, but it's a really important thing to think about now that the sort of groundwork has been laid, the foundations in terms of uh, knowing your impact, committing to change, uh, and engaging and having a culture of sustainability. Now you wanna start tackling projects and low hanging fruit is the best place to, to start for that. So even if the projects that are sort of low hanging fruit for you guys uh, aren't maybe the biggest area of GHG impact, like for example, um, uh, composting is, is something that a lot of staff will notice right away if an organization isn't composting. Um, it might not have the biggest GHG impact compared to business travel or, or heating a building, but we know that um, building momentum and, and getting people on with some quick wins can really uh, demonstrate the process to management and build enthusiasm among uh, employees more generally to, to keep up the work. So this is a really great first step to sort of hit the ground running, so to speak. Um, and like I said, demonstrates possibilities, puts your processes to the test, identifies other members that you might need for your green team or sustainability committee uh, to move things forward, uh, that kind of thing. So. Um, really helpful. And of course, uh, if, if there are incentives and rebates that your green team is tracking and aware of and they're available right now, uh, that can basically uh, make some fruit hang even lower, if, if that expression makes sense. Uh, something that might have been a good idea is kind of a no-brainer once, once you're getting enough money back that it's the, the more cost-effective option and, uh, and better for the environment as well. Um, other examples are like replacing incandescent light bulbs with LEDs, really important. Um, there's no reason to be using incandescent light bulbs anymore. Uh, but again, electricity doesn't have the hugest emissions factor. So it's a very visible thing. Staff will notice the difference right away. And then you can move on to some projects that might have a, a deeper GHG impact. Um, one kind of project that tends to have really deep impacts that does fit into the low hanging fruit category is what we call sort of equipment life cycle replacements. And this is something that is really important to keep track of, especially if you operate a building or, or any heavy equipment. Um, it's to keep track of what needs replacing now and what needs replacing soon. Uh, because replacing a perfectly functional uh, gas furnace with an electric heating system will reduce your energy consumption or, or your GHG emissions long term, but it's not very efficient because the manufacturer of those systems also has a footprint uh, and ultimately you don't want to be sort of wasting a perfectly good uh, furnace and throwing it into a landfill or something. I mean, there are ways that you could potentially move that to somewhere else. It could be of use, but we'll talk about equipment lifestyle, uh, uh, circular economy as we go on here. But jumping back in here, um, uh, it's important to look at as you reach the end of uh, your equipment life cycle, what are the greenest options? Knowing that if you're replacing equipment uh, that is going to have to be replaced anyway, then you don't have to worry about sort of the efficiency of, of ridding yourself of perfectly good functioning equipment that's not as efficient. Um, this way you are also comparing the cost of a new uh, greener, more efficient system with um, 
a brand new, less efficient system. So the cost difference is going to be less than if you were just outright replacing a system from scratch. Um, so that's a really important way to make sure that you're looking at low hanging fruit. If you're already going to be doing the work to upgrade your heating system, go for a greener option. The cost difference will be minimal and the payback period will be shorter than if you were doing it uh, before your equipment is at its end of the life. Um, also look for uh, equipment with certifications like Energy Star uh, when you're comparing sort of similar pieces of equipment. Uh, these are certifications that, uh, that help sort of set a baseline and compare different projects or different products rather that um, you as a consumer might not know the difference between two different types of furnace. So uh, it's a great way of making sure that uh, any kind of appliance um, is at least meeting that base standard. Uh, and of course, uh, regulations are constantly changing. Um, uh, we know that new construction homes in Ottawa uh, won't be allowed to use natural gas for much longer. Uh, switching over to electric heat pumps is sort of the standard. And we're likely to see those changes happening on a commercial side uh, in the future as well. Um, now, another way to identify sort of low hanging fruit would be to conduct an energy audit um, to identify those key opportunities. We talked a bit about this during the discovery phase, but um, one of the other advantages of this, aside from knowing your impact overall, is that they will identify those pieces of equipment that are reaching end of life, that, that aren't operating at efficiency that they were when, when you bought them, uh, and helps you sort of plan and prioritize retrofit options in an order that makes sense, uh, making sure that you are addressing the building envelope before you uh, replace the heating system, because you don't want to end up with a heating system that's uh, too big or too small for your needs once the, once the building itself is more efficient at retaining the heat and the cold air. So just making sure that things are in order, this is a great way if you have sort of a lot of different options of, of making sure a professional has taken a look and, and guided you along a path there. Now, um, another uh, important aspect, once you've sort of dealt with low-hanging fruit, is automation. Uh, sometimes this is low-hanging fruit, but it's an area that uh, tends to get overlooked. Um, it improves the performance of your building and office space uh, through systems like, um, like lighting and heating, uh, not having to um, rely on manual inputs uh, for changes. So um, this can include like uh, motion sensors that um, operate revolving doors uh, so that you don't end up leaving a door open um, to, to let the heat out. Uh, also ambient light or motion sensors for lighting in different uh, workspaces. For example, boardrooms uh, have a lot of success with that. It's really common for a group of people to leave a boardroom, uh, be chatting, and someone doesn't turn the lights off and they stay on for several hours, maybe even the screen or, or a computer you're using for a presentation. Uh, and this is an unnecessary waste of energy and GHGs. So uh, having an automated timer that maybe after a couple of minutes of no uh, detected motion, um, uh, the lights and the screen shut off, or when the ambient light is high enough from windows, the, the lights shut off so that people don't leave them on uh, from the morning. Uh, these are things that kind of, uh, again, take, the, take away the need to train employees, uh, sort of uh, take up their time, take up their mental focus, um, and reduces the impact that occupant behavior can have on the building when people do leave windows open and things like that. So uh, it makes things easier and less time and consuming for everybody. Um, it, uh, it is also important to communicate why you're doing it. Sometimes uh, automatically setting a thermostat um, can... Uh, ruffle some feathers if people have different sort of comfort issues in the workplace. So you definitely, again, want to make sure you've already engaged, you've talked to different people at the organization, you've made sure that concerns are heard before you start taking steps. Um, but uh, making sure you're communicating the why and, uh, and sort of even the savings, if you're able to capture what the savings are, uh, that's a really good way um, to, to get buy-in for, for building automation. Although most people are, are game to just have to think about less. They don't have to turn off their power bars at the end of the day. If, if you can automate those, set them on timers. Um, and again, if, if heating and cooling is centrally controlled, it tends to be more efficient uh, than moving it up and down all throughout the day. You can also program in setbacks, which are really uh, effective, where you um, set the temperature to go up uh, in the winter a little bit before people arrive. And then you set it to uh, the heating system to shut off maybe a half an hour before people leave because the temperature won't drop immediately. It takes time for that heat to leave the building, especially as people are getting up and moving around and generating body heat as they're, as they're packing up for the day and leaving. Um, an automated system, especially a smart automated system, will be able to keep the office at a temperature without generating more heat. Uh, and it'll know sort of the best times to, to set those th set, setbacks for you. Um, we, we actually read in a, in a magazine, Distributed Energy, that recent studies have shown that building automation can reduce utility and operating costs by up to 15%. And more specifically, building automations uh, adjusting thermostat and lights um, based on usage patterns, occupancy, have overall energy savings of up to 30%. 
We've actually seen this in our network. Uh, KRP Properties, one of our new members, uh, saw a 25% reduction in energy costs from one of their buildings that they automated uh, just from the automation. And that's a huge chunk, obviously, uh, of costs. Uh, Your Credit Union is another long-term member of ours. They surpassed their 20% targets for GHG reductions in only three years and credited a large part of that to the building automation systems they put in uh, just to keep things running smoothly without people having to think about it. Um, so there's more uh, savings in, in automation than a lot of people probably think of when it comes to energy and, and things like that. Corporate transportation. So this is uh, step six. This is another important one, uh, and it does cover a lot of different things. In Ottawa, 40% of local emissions are from transportation. Uh, that can be fleets. Um, that could also be um, sort of uh, how employees are getting to and from events, even if that's sort of personal vehicles. It means long distance air travel or, or train travel, uh, even bus travel. Basically any transportation that your organization has control of and that's done uh, in the course of your operations. Um, and so there are some easy things that you can do to make reductions in this area. And, and what those are will really depend on how your organization moves around, if at all. Uh, some organizations do a lot more uh, mobile work than others. So uh, obviously um, not everything will apply to everybody, but these are some sort of some, some key easy ones. So maintaining tire pressure uh, gets overlooked a lot. Um, keeping tire, pressure properly inflated, it can prevent, uh, based on one estimate, 250 pounds of CO2 from the average vehicle uh, entering the atmosphere every year. Um, that's about 48 liters of gas a year. Uh, these are American figures, so um, it may be slightly different here, but it's still a lot, obviously. Um, and uh, um, efficient driving skills are another one, where if you're just teaching people to um, accelerate more gradually, uh, don't accelerate really quickly and then stop because you're kind of wasting all that momentum. Let yourself coast when you can. Uh, driving the speed limit is uh, more fuel efficient than, than driving more quickly. So just some of these sort of um, easy things uh, that you can do for very little cost can actually have a huge reduction on the, um, on the impact of your, of your transportation. There are also uh, technologies available to help drivers out with stuff like that. I know a lot of hybrid cars will sort of measure uh, the efficiency of your driving as you go. Um, you're accelerating and decelerating. There's also driver assist technologies that will um, sort of find the most efficient GPS route between several uh, points on a map. That will help if you're sort of a, a company or organization that travels to different work sites, um, maybe several in a day, it can be a really helpful way to make sure you're doing that as efficiently as possible. Um, and then of course, uh, upgrading to fully electric or even hybrid vehicles are a really great way to cut emissions if you're, if you're gonna be driving around a lot. Um, as I mentioned, uh, electricity in Ontario has a relatively low emissions factor compared to most fossil fuels, including natural gas, but also gasoline and diesel. Um, so much lower footprint uh, to get them around. Um, and of course, hosting charging stations is a great way to um, build out that infrastructure and encourage um, employees who are commuting uh, that to, to make the switch to electric vehicles or hybrids as well, because um, it means that uh, they don't have to worry about whether or not they can, they can charge their vehicle at home and get home at the end of the day, uh, some of that range anxiety abated. So uh, these are all different ways that um, uh, you, can, you can basically uh, improve the, the um, uh, emissions footprint of your transportation. And I say host of charging stations uh, also about commuting, also for your fleet, of course, if you can charge your own fleet, uh, that's better than having to do it off-site. Um, now, of course, uh, uh, business travel, um, limiting and avoiding air travel is sort of the key to all of this, choosing rail whenever possible. This is something that we see really often between Toronto and Ottawa making a big difference. Uh, short haul flights are the least efficient um, because they have to spend a lot of fuel during takeoff and landing, and that's basically most of the flight when it's, uh, when it's that distance. Um, long haul flights are also pretty inefficient because they have to carry a lot of extra fuel to, to cross oceans and things. Uh, but short haul flights are usually most easily avoided because they have other options like via rail. Via rail does this great comparison as well between productive time of uh, uh, traveling by airplane and by uh, via rail, where um, between sort of the security gates and the airport and everything else, uh, you actually don't have that much time on a crowded airplane to get any work done. Whereas with via, the, the process is a bit smoother. And even though the overall trip might take slightly longer, uh, you actually are able to work for a good chunk of that time uh, in comfort on the train. So um, a few different ways to contextualize it uh, for people who might be in a hurry and think air travel is the faster option. Uh, it's always better to go with, go with rail from a GHE perspective and from an efficiency perspective often. Uh, but of course, using phone and video conferencing, which most of us have been doing for the past year and a half, uh, is definitely the best option um, because it's associated with much fewer emissions. And if you do have to travel, 
uh, looking for, again, electric vehicles, um, green key hotels, um, sustainable amenities and services in, in the city or, or whatever location you find yourself in for work. Uh, these are great ways to reduce the overall impact of, of business transportation. Now, commuting, we'll talk a little bit about here. Um, uh, commuting is something that maybe has you have less control of than corporate transportation as an organization, but you can encourage good behaviors and you can you can make it easier for, for employees to make good choices, uh, which ultimately will reduce the impact that your organization has uh, by operating and by having staff. So um, again, this is, uh, uh, we'll go over this quickly because under circumstances right now, there's not um, as much commuting happening as there used to be. But when there is, um, remember to think beyond the car. Uh, we tend to always think of commuting as taking place in a car. We have a car-centric culture, parking, 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 although we talk about a lot of places have a parking policy. Um, we encourage you to adopt a commuting or transportation policy that's more all-inclusive. Um, the cost of building one new parking spot can be as high as like 24,000 um, for an above ground, 34,000 for an underground. And on top of that, there's maintenance that's estimated around like 200 to 250 for, for an above ground surface spot and 500 uh, a year for an underground spot, just in terms of toll booths, attendance, plowing, uh, maintenance, heating, that kind of stuff. So um, there is a cost that your business is paying if you're providing free parking that you might not even realize. And if you're not also paying to incentivize other forms of transportation, you're unknowingly encouraging employees to stay in single occupancy vehicles. Um, so, uh, if we move away from that, move into sort of a different kind of um, uh, policy, like what does that look like? How do, how do we make that work? Well, um, including bike parking is a big one. Just a bike rack is a really big incentive for people who want to maybe transport themselves more actively by bicycle or, or another kind of self-powered vehicle they could lock up. Uh, and you can usually fit about 12 bikes in one parking spot. So it's a really efficient use of space. Um, it doesn't have to be like everything fancy from the beginning, like a closed-in shelter or anything like that. You want to start with a rack, but um, uh, lighting and, and something to protect from the rain are great upgrades uh, to, to install if you can see that people are taking advantage of this. Um, also just including information about transit uh, can really help people. That's a free way to promote um, people using transit, but we've also seen uh, organizations that will um, subsidize bus passes in place of uh, parking spots and things like that. So this is a really great way to make sure that people are choosing the best option, not just the, the easiest option based on the infrastructure that, uh, that we take for granted. Uh, and of course, carpooling, if you go on ottawaridematch.com, organizations can set up a, a customized portal so that um, colleagues can uh, match with each other for carpooling from different areas of the city. That can be real helpful to cut emissions. Uh, remote working, obviously, we're pretty familiar with now, but that is a huge uh, reduction. So even um, before the pandemic, uh, a few working from home days a week can, can really make a big difference. And uh, of course, as I mentioned before, charging stations, it's great to be able to incentivize uh, for staff uh, that want to invest in uh, more sustainable commuting options for themselves to support them on the, on the end of the workplace during the workday. Now, uh, reducing waste, uh, again, this is a very natural first step because it's very visual. It doesn't always have the highest GHG impact and it can be hard to measure because it's, the impact will vary by sort of material and facility. Um, but doing a waste audit is a great way to sort of get a handle on your waste as an organization. You can, you can pay for one or you can do one internally. Essentially, you're just looking at the waste. You maybe take a sample of one week, uh, maybe different times of the year, identify sort of what kinds of waste you see uh, going into the bins. Uh, the ones you see a lot of, you might want to focus on making reductions on. Um, and of course, uh, uh, knowing sort of uh, how that changes over time. So if you're conducting these audits, checking out your waste over time, uh, you can see if, um, Putting in an organic bin has really had the success that you wanted to, for example, uh, or if there are, or if there are specific e-waste products, you could do a better job of disposing of. Uh, so this is a great way to sort of take a baseline there, um, making sure you have the basic system in place first of all to get rid of the stuff, uh, proper signage to make sure that um, people know how to use it. Uh, that waxed coffee cup, uh, where does it go? Plastic, cardboard, compost. Uh, it's good to make sure that even when it seems simple, there's a there's a clear guide, and then setting a target. Maybe saying you want to divert at least 50% of your waste from landfill. Uh, so that means that at least half of your, your waste is going to recycling uh, or organics rather than a landfill. And you can do that by weight. Uh, I usually uh, just lift the bag, uh, step on a bathroom scale, put the bag down, weigh myself again, and then you can tell sort of the weight of the, of the waste itself. So that's a great way to do it uh, easily. Uh, if you have uh, an amount of waste that you can, you can lift. A larger company uh, may wanna do a paid audit or, or uh, come up with a plan with whoever their waste hauler is. 
Uh, now with e-waste and the circular economy, this is worth a particular mention. E-waste obviously um, has a lot of environmental impacts. There's a lot of uh, elements and, and metals in there that uh, really should be disposed of pro properly. So making sure they don't go to landfill is, is really important. Um, buying secondhand, uh, both with electronics and any other real product that's long-term is a great way to, to keep something out of the landfill and reduce costs for your own organization uh, in terms of uh, meeting your needs. Uh, and on the other hand, on the other side of things, when you're when you're not using a product anymore, uh, maybe you've moved on to something else, or it just doesn't fit your operations, um, you can sell it or give it away before you throw it away. Uh, throwing it away is the path of least resistance. It's easy. You know where the garbage is usually. But if you can find a way to find another organization that could use that, um, or uh, or even uh, like that is really keen on it, um, I, we've seen a couple of examples uh, with waste, for example. Um, uh, selling um, bioplastics that can't go into the compost to Ento farms where they raise uh, mealworms and things. Um, that's a really interesting innovative solution that the Shepherds of Good Hope was exploring. Um, uh, Cascades Recovery in Ottawa, I know, collect paper towel, I uh, use paper towel to recycle into new products. So there are businesses out there uh, that can utilize your products and uh, you can even set up sort of long-term working relationships uh, with stuff you learned a lot of. Um, this kind of seeks into greening your supply chain, uh, which is that um, you want to make sure that the things that you're you're purchasing and the things that and the ways that you're sort of getting your products to market are, are as green as possible. Um, you don't always have direct control over this, uh, but you do often have a lot of influence. So this includes products and services, and includes upstream and downstream. So it could be products you buy um, to to conduct your operations or turn into new products, services that you need. A good example would be sort of a bike courier. If you're able to um, deliver things uh, through a bike courier rather than uh, sort of a typical delivery service for local packages, uh, you reduce your emissions dramatically. So that's um, something you can look at. Um, I am conscious of time. Here's an example. KRP Properties is one of our newer online members, and they gave me uh, an example of uh, what their sort of purchasing policy focuses on. And so you can see a whole bunch of different areas to focus on locally produced, energy efficient, um, uh, some like yeah, the janitorial companies they use have to meet certain standards. So uh, there are different ways you can influence things that aren't, in, again, your direct control, but are sort of uh, within your power uh, to have influence on. And finally, offsets. Uh, we like to mention these, uh, but you do have to be careful. Um, it's good to offset your, your, your emissions from electricity and fossil fuel usage locally, especially uh, when you can't make those reductions right away or eliminate them right away. Uh, bullfrog power is a really common one for both natural gas and electricity in Ottawa. Uh, you can do this for your business, you can even do it for your home. Um, so it's a great way to mitigate the impact that you're having now. Uh, and you can purchase them with travel as well. Uh, most airlines will offer this uh, and hotels, so it's a great way to mitigate your uh, impacts from there. But it isn't a replacement for absolute reductions. So um, you do want to make sure that they're accredited. Uh, that whatever project is granting the offsets is legit and is backed um, by third parties and uh, and has been sort of vetted uh, because you don't want to sort of be purchasing offsets and then have people later criticize uh, criticize your choices and, and undermine the work that you've been doing. But we also like to say don't let offsets offset your focus. Ultimately, to meet our targets by of net zero by 2050, we have to actually make the absolute reductions to GHG emissions. So offsets are a great interim step. Uh, and they're a great communications tool to show that you're dedicated, you're committed to mitigating your impact uh, as soon as possible. But in the long term, offsets need to give way to actual reductions. So, so don't ever forget that. Okay, so we are running up a bit on time. I don't see a ton of questions in the chat, uh, but we are reached in here. So the 10 steps in a nutshell, we've got through them all. Here they are up on the screen for a refresher. Uh, and uh, we just wanted to thank you uh, for coming by today and uh, and for for taking part and doing doing what you can to build knowledge, build um, build sustainability within Ottawa. So um, don't forget uh, to check out, we have uh, a whole bunch of other workshops through the Let's Talk Green Economy series. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the one today, learn something you can bring back to your workplace. Um, these are all sort of business oriented workshops. Envire Center does a ton of other work. It's currently Let's Bike Month. Uh, so don't forget to um, uh, sign up for that if you guys are commuting by cycle uh, in the sort of a different era of Envire Center, green transportation, green cities. Uh, but these are all sort of our business oriented, workplace oriented workshops that are available online. Um, and uh, you can also visit uh, the link at the bottom to see them there. Um, 
but thank you very much. I, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. I do see a question in the chat about whether we're going to be posting the presentation. Yes, uh, Enviro Center has a YouTube channel. There's a ton of great videos, uh, other workshops, webinars, presentations we've done up there. Um, there are some workshops and webinars that are private. They're members only, uh, members of the Ottawa Green Business Program Network, um, but lots of other free resources, including the, the workshops that I just showed on the last slide there. Uh, are up uh, available online, including this presentation will be will be posted up there. It will take a few days likely to uh, be processed and posted, uh, but you can check back then and we'll send a follow-up email as well, uh, with a little bit more information and links you guys can click through. Um, so uh, thanks again. Uh, we, we'd love to hear from anyone who wants to reach out about steps you're taking, uh, whether there are any of these 10 or, or additional ones or experiences you've had uh, reducing your GHG impacts. Um, don't forget to sign up for the Envire Center Green Beat newsletter if you haven't done that already. It's a great way to stay informed about uh, climate news, uh, both locally and globally, upcoming events uh, like this one and others uh, that we're running or that uh, we have partners that are running. Um, Mandy has posted a link in the chat. She will likely post another one just to make sure it gets seen. Uh, and of course, you can always visit us at envirocenter.ca or ottawagreenbusiness.ca uh, to check out those programs. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mandy, who organized today's event and provided tech support all the way through. Uh, let me know when you guys stop hearing me. So that was great. Uh, and I appreciate um, everything you're doing back there, Mandy. So thank you. Uh, so thanks again to everybody on here today. Thanks again to all of our sponsors, all of our members who are doing great work, all of you who are taking us back to your workplaces and pushing the envelope on green business and, and making Ottawa the most sustainable community that we can uh, as soon as possible. So have a great afternoon and thanks again. <laughs>